the United States, the House of Representatives approved a budget to fund government agencies for 45 days without aid to Ukraine, avoiding a shutdown. Russia and Venezuela signed an interparliamentary cooperation agreement to strengthen bilateral relations. And in Zimbabwe, authorities report at least six miners dead and over 40 still trapped on the ground after a mine collapse in Shegutu district. Hello, welcome to From the South. I'm Luis Alberto Matos from Adresso Studios in Havana, Cuba. We begin with the news. In Mexico, the ninth meeting of the Puebla Group is progressing at the International Baroque Museum in the homonymous city. The progressive international meeting is being held to fight hunger, economic blockades, the climate crisis and deglobalization. Former President Ernesto Samper of Colombia assured that all the current world political events are part of the change of era and mark in some way the beginning of the end of the previous one. He also stressed that it is necessary to continue fighting to defeat the ultra-right governments. Venezuelan Vice President Elsa Rodriguez welcomed the support of the Pueblo Group against the blockade imposed against her country by the government of the United States and its allies. Over these nine years, this organization has issued many statements in support of Venezuela's sovereignty and territorial integrity. It has also rejected the illegitimate, illegal, inhumane, criminal blockade against Venezuela, also against Cuba. So I would like to thank you personally. The vice president also emphasized the importance of diversifying the economy with the use of currencies other than the U.S. dollar in order to achieve de-dollarization. We know that the U.S. dollar represents the hegemonic currency in international reserves, in trade exchanges, in financial operations. As you know, Venezuela has been completely excluded from the SWIFT international messaging system. So regarding de-dollarization, this year has been particularly important, and the world has understood the need to diversify financial operations with other currencies diversifying a non-dollar currency portfolio. On Saturday in Guatemala, the Public Prosecutor's Office carried out a new raid to the headquarters of the Supreme Electoral Tribunal with the objective of gathering information for alleged irregularities in the presidential elections, although the institution assures that the procedure is not related to the political party seat movement, which recently won the presidential elections. The prosecution intends to seize the Electoral Acts 4 and 8, which contain the sum of the votes. For her part, the magistrate Blanca Alafaro assured that the results were already duly officialized, including the triumph of the president-elect, who must assume next January. It is the fourth raid carried out by the prosecutor's office to the headquarters of the Electoral Tribunal in the last two months for alleged anomalies in the electoral process. In Ecuador, preparations continue for the presidential debate between the candidates Lisa Gonzalez of the Citizens Revolution and Daniel Novoa of National Democratic Action. The debate will take place on October 1st at 7 p.m. local time at the headquarters of Ecuador TV Channel. The Metropolitan Transit Agency and the National Electoral Council informed that due to the meeting of both presidential aspirants, the surrounding areas are closed for vehicle traffic, thus guaranteeing security. In this sense, Gonzalez and Novoa will discuss for an hour and a half their proposals on four main issues, economic security, social inclusion, and policies. On October 15th, Ecuadorians will go to the polls to choose the next nation's next president after Guillermo Lasso implemented on May the so-called cross-death to bring his term to an early end. On Saturday, the United States House of Representatives approved a temporary spending bill that will keep the government open for 45 days. The initiative received 335 affirmative votes and 91 negative votes. It was approved with the support of the majority of Democratic representatives, which joined its votes to Republicans. The initiative is intended to avoid a shutdown of the executive branch as of October 1st, when a new fiscal year begins. The initiative includes funds to help U.S. citizens affected by catastrophes, but does not provide resources to finance aid to Ukraine. The initiative must now be voted in the Senate, which is controlled by the party of President Joe Biden.
On Friday, the Libyan government announced a prompt compensation to September 10th flood victims. The flooding caused by Storm Daniel was made worse by the collapse of two dams in Derna. As a result, 3,893 people died, according to the latest official report. Deputy Interior Minister Fahad Kaim said people whose houses were completely destroyed will get 100,000 Libyan diners, the equivalent of 19,000 euros. Those whose houses suffer partial damage will get 50,000, and those who lost furniture and household appliances will be getting 20,000. This announcement came amid fears of corruption and mismanagement of funds allocated for reconstruction, raised by UN envoy to Libya, Abdullah Bathili, last Thursday in Brussels, when he urged for proper management of these funds during consultations with the European Commission. Let's take a short break now, but remember you can join us on TikTok at Telesur English, where you will find news in different formats, news updates, and much more. All the stories coming up, stay with us. Governments of Russia and Venezuela signed an interparliamentary cooperation agreement to strengthen bilateral relations. The information was made public by the lower house of the Russian Federal Assembly on its official website. According to the published document, the signing of these documents took place after a meeting between the president of the Russian state Duma, Vyacheslav Volodin, and the president of the National Assembly of Venezuela, Jorge Rodriguez, within the framework of the International Conference Russia-Latin America. Both parties shared their position on the significance of this agreement, stressing that it will serve to promote development through interparliamentary dialogue and expand bilateral cooperation ties. In the framework of his visit to Moscow, the President of the National Assembly of Venezuela, Jorge Rodriguez, presented a brief at the monument to the Latin American liberator Simon Bolivar. Prior to this act, Rodriguez visited the monument to the unknown soldier, where he also presented a brief in recognition of the bloodshed by the Russian people during the Second World War to guarantee the victory of the Allied forces against Nazism. The Venezuelan delegation of parliamentarians in Russia is part of their visit to the first international Russia Latin American Parliamentary Conference to be held in Moscow from September 29th to October 2nd. Next to the statue of the Hero of America, in a beautiful tribute that the people of the city of Moscow have made to our liberator Simon Bolivar and his libertarian dead of the American continent, very moved to bring a wreath to this monument that portrays the glory of the greatest of America, our liberator Simon Bolivar. The president of the National Assembly of Venezuela, Jorge Rodriguez, emphasized that this meeting between parliamentary representatives of Latin America is propitious not only for the meeting of peoples, but should serve to provide solutions to the problems that affect the nations. This is an event for peace in this meeting of Russian parliamentarians. Russia and Latin America for peace, for parliaments to be the main instrument of cooperation, the instrument of encounter and instrument of searching common solutions to the problems that afflict our people. The German government announced tightening controls along its border with Poland and the Czech Republic in response to political pressure to deal with the growing number of migrants. On Germany's border with Poland, the Eisenhutenstadt Migrant Reception Center is overcrowded. According to the director of the institution, they receive around 100 people on a daily basis. It's expected to increase to 120. The center is one of the first dams in the face of a new wave of refugees that has led to the government to take measure to limit entries in the face of lively debate in the country. The situation is comparable to that of the summer 2015, when Chancellor Angela Merkel opened Germany's doors to more than one million refugees, mostly Syrians. Pope Francis raised 21 clergymen from distant corners of the world to the rank of cardinals. At the ceremony known as the Consistory, the ninth under Pope Francis, the 86-year-old Pope said diversity is indispensable for the future of the Catholic Church, which currently has 1.3 billion believers worldwide. The choice of the new cardinals, who include diplomats, close advisors and administrators, is closely watched as an indicator of the priorities and position of the Church. One of these newly appointed cardinals could eventually be elected by his peers to succeed Francis, who has hinted he could be stepping down should his health warrant it.
On Saturday, Slovakia held a legislative elections to determine the country's foreign policy, including a possible halt to the support for neighboring Ukraine, one of the main issues of the campaign. Over 4 million citizens were called to cast their votes in these elections. The race will decide between the Esmeris Di Party of former Prime Minister Robert Fico and the progressive Slovakia formation of Michael Simeka, Vice President of the European Parliament. The winner will need the support of other smaller parties to achieve a majority in the 150-seat Congress. The resulting government will replace the centre-right coalition cabinet in power since 2020. Voters attending the polling centres stress the importance of these elections to bring changes to the country. Elections are important to me so that something changes in the country. Our political culture and behavior of politicians has sunk very low, and it would be good if it changed. I also think that our children deserve a dignified future. Politicians should change their attitude and stop bragging about how supposedly honest they are about helping everyone from the poorest to the middle class. They ought to stop lying. In the Maldives, where nearly all ballot boxes counted, the candidate of the opposition progressive party of the Maldives-led coalition won 53% of the vote, while incumbent President Ibrahim Mohamed Soli obtained 46%. Mohamed Muisu, who now president-elect, is the current mayor of the capital, Mali. Soli's defeat to Muisu marks the first time Maldivians have voted out a liberal democratic government since the country held its first multi-party elections in 2008. Parliament Speaker and former President Mohamed Nasheed congratulated Muisu on his apparent second-round victory. The election was seen as a referendum on whether to hitch his fortunes to China or India. Muisu helms a party that presided over an influx of Chinese investment money when it last held power and has signaled a return to Beijing's orbit. We have a second short break coming up, but before we invite you to visit our YouTube channel at Telesur English, there you'll be able to re-watch our interviews, top stories, special broadcastings and more. Hit the subscribe button and activate the notification bell to stay up to date on the world's most recent events. Final show break, don't go away. Welcome back from the south. In Zimbabwe, about 40 mine employees in Chakari Chekutu district are reportedly trapped on the ground and at least six deaths reported after a mine collapse Friday morning. Rescuers warned that the death toll could rise as the removal search and rescue efforts continue. They also detailed that the number of people trapped on the ground is not yet known. However, according to the records, more than 40 people were in the mine at the moment when the walls collapsed. Some of these workers managed to get out quickly before the earth began to move. In the Democratic Republic of the Congo, opposition politician Martin Fayulu confirms his candidacy for the presidential election to be held on December 20th. Fayulu will face current President Felix Tshisekedi, who has been in power since January 2019 and is standing for re-election. Having listened to the people's urgent request, the Lamuka Coalition has decided to submit my candidacy for the presidential election in December 2023. We are going to continue to fight to demand greater transparency in the elections, just as we didn't achieve transparency through the audit of the electoral register. We will achieve it through election monitoring. We fully agree with the Senso ECC Electoral Reservation Mission that, and I quote, transparency and inclusion are elevated for peace and stability in the Democratic Republic of Congo before, during, and after the elections. Thank you very much. In Somalia, at least five people were killed in a suicide bomb attack in the capital of Mogadishu. Somali authorities are investigating this new attack by the rival group Al Shabaab on a tea shop at a checkpoint on the road to the presidential palace and parliament. According to the perpetrators, the explosion actually killed 11 military personnel and wounded 18 other people. Also on Saturday, members of the radical group threw a grenade at the checkpoint in Selesha Bijasha on the outskirts of Mogadishu, but their no casualties have yet been reported. And they also exploded a car bomb, which killed at least six people and wounded 15 others in Bulobute in the Hiran region. This Al Shabaab offensive follows an army raid last Monday in the Muduk region, in which 70 Al Shabaab militants were killed.
In Palestine, a new Israeli attack left one young Palestinian dead and another injured. According to the Palestinian Health Ministry, the young man died as a result of severe gunshot wounds in the town of al Sbire. Israeli soldiers set up a roadblock at the entrance of the settlement and opened fire on the vehicle in which the two youth were traveling. According to the Palestinian Red Crescent, Israeli occupation forces prevented the entry of rescue teams to the scene of the incident. Local media claimed that the wounded youth were transported on stretchers by the military to the settlement before the arrival of Israeli ambulances to the scene. In China, the Syrian President Bashar al-Assad accused the United States of colluding with terrorists who are smuggling oil from the Middle Eastern country, leading to a widespread energy crisis across Syria. During his first visit to the country since 2004, Assad held meetings with Chinese President Xi Jinping and attended the opening ceremony of the 19th Asian Games in the eastern city of Hansu. In an interview with China's Central Television, the visiting Assad discussed a number of key issues, highlighting the hugely damaging impact that predominantly U.S.-led foreign interference has had on his country and on the Middle East region in general. Assad said the U.S. has shown to be responsible for stealing other countries' resources by force through acts of piracy. <laughs> Yes, behind all the oil wells controlled by the terrorists in northeast Syria is the United States. So, it is not just a mark of theft. They are also colluding with terrorists and sharing benefits. This means even some global superpowers are working with terrorists. This is what's happening in Syria. As a result, we have lost oil resources and made wheat producing areas in that region. You note, we used to be a wheat exporting country, but now we only have a very little wheat. We are are also facing power shortage. How can people live without electricity? We only have a tiny amount of electricity to support people's lives. It is not enough. In China, on the first day of the Golden Week holiday, a record number of rail commuters were on the move. The Traffic Management Department reported high traffic volume after monitoring 500 major nodes in 71 expressways. As the holiday week began on Friday, the national railroads also registered the record number of 20 million passengers for a single day. Authorities have deployed personnel to handle the increase of travelers during this year's Golden Week, while analysts predict that this will be the busiest holiday week in years. We have come to the end of this news brief and you can find these and many other stories on our website tresorenglish.net. Also join us on social media, Facebook, X, Instagram, Telegram and TikTok. For Tresor English, I'm Luis Alberto Matos. Thank you for watching.